people I haven't seen since orientation, which is crazy, but it's, all, it's fun. Um, so I'm going to tell you about my study of spatial accessibility, um, and a little bit of what I did, and, and some findings that I had. Um, I ended up uh, um, narrowing the, 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 the scope of the project primarily because of data limitations and time constraints. Um, so I ended up focusing only on spatial accessibility to health, public health and public education services and really um, within the metropolitan region. So just, just to review what I talked about you know, nine months ago, the, the reason that spatial accessibility matters is because um, whether or not you can access a school or you can access a health clinic will, can affect whether or not you can access the, the services or participate. So um, it can really directly affect your participation and then therefore perhaps your health or educational outcomes. Um, and Santiago in Chile um, is a pretty um, spatially segregated and um, in some ways unequal society and so spatial accessibility is not going to be the same for depending on what you know what background you're you're coming from. Um, so in so I'm going to start with education and then I'll move to health and what I did. So with education, um, oh and the other thing I should say is that when I started the project, um, I was going and thinking I would create relatively simple measures of accessibility and use those to look at patterns um, and, and sort of thinking about relative accessibility um, when you and, and on a comparative basis. But working at the Ministry of Social Development, one of the first things that came out of um, conversations that I had with the director of the research division was that they were really interested in creating measures that were going to be um, useful for perhaps one, an additional tool for planning purposes, like infrastructure, like, oh, here's a, a region of the city that looks like has low spatial accessibility. Let's also consider some other factors. Maybe that's an area where we want to you know, think about putting in some uh, you know, another um, preschool or something like that. But what that means is that the, the actual measures of spatial accessibility need to try to reflect reality as closely as possible. So that set me down a path of really a lot of what my project was about, was trying to develop a methodology that could best represent true spatial accessibility to schools or to health clinics. So for education, I was focusing on um, Elementary school, which is <coughs> children six to thirteen. Um, although these, me you know, the methodology could be replicated for like high school and for daycare, but I um, just because of time and data, I focused on um, elementary schools. And then in the metropolitan region, so one of the major data constraints was that the sample that I was using, which is of low-income households, geo that the geocoded batch is only in urban areas and 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 the best data is actually in the metropolitan region. Um, there's not the data layer needed to be able to geocode in rural areas, and geocoding results were weaker in other regions. So that was the reason that I focused on, for education, at least the most urban area of Santiago. And what I ended up incorporating into a measure of accessibility is obviously uh, your basic travel time, and I chose travel time by foot um, along roads because that gives you, first of all, a lot of children do travel to school, do walk to school, um, and secondly, uh, it gives you a nice local focus of spatial accessibility, and ultimately that was what I was interested in, is what is your local environment. So walking distance is a, allows you to capture that a lot better. Um, I looked at cap capacity, so even if you have a school nearby, can the school actually serve you? Do they have vacant slots available? Um, and then quality uh, was a, a school of a certain um, level of quality so as to receive say, um, like additional sort of subsidy bonus from the state. I had data about that. And then um, was the school, did the school charge a co-payment? So I'm only looking at private, at public, the, the public school system, but in Chile there's private schools that are fully, completely private. Those were out of my sample. And then there are municipal schools which are like 99% completely free. And then there are these private subsidized schools which um, receive state funding, but also may or may not charge parents a copay. And that copay can range from being very a very small copay to be quite a large monthly copay. So I was looking at um, mostly if the school is free. So either municipal or private subsidized, but not charging a copay. 
And I created essentially like a slew of indicators or measures of, of spatial accessibility, ranging from super basic to uh, more complex. So the, the, the simplest one is just what's this, what's this walking time to your nearest school? Um, so these are uh, comuna averages uh, in, in Gran Santiago, the urban part of Santiago. The, the, this is the walking time. And then the darkest is walking average walking time for children in each comuna to any school, any, any public school. The, the middle uh, sort of like bit reddish color is um, average walking time to a school that's of, the, of high quality, as I was defining it with my data. And then the, bay, the light yellow is average walking time to a school that's both high quality and free. And so the pattern you can see here is that, generally speaking, um, on average, kids have a school within 10 minutes walking. Um, so this is not really an, an infrastructure issue. There are schools near, near to children. Um, and it doesn't really affect where the comuna that you live in is not really affecting um, whether or not you have a <coughs> close by. Um, but when you start to take into account um, quality, and especially quality and co-payments, you can start to see there's a ton of variation. Um, and so, like for example, when you compare San Ramon which is, and San Joaquin, San Ramon is an especially um, lower income uh, comuna. Uh, there's just like here, there's a giant jump in walking time if you want, if a child wants to be able to reach a school that's both free and high quality. Whereas in San Joaquin, the 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 um, the times are all pretty much the same, which means that a large share, almost all of the schools that are nearby, are also going to be high quality and affordable, free. So, so it does, the comuna where you would live doesn't affect so much whether or not you have a school nearby, but it does, it is going to impact whether or not you can access the school that's high quality and affordable, um, which is a, really important for low-income families, but both of those, both of those um, aspects. But the, the thing about that indicator is it doesn't really take into account your local context. So you might have a school, two kids could have a school five minutes away, but one could could have five other schools nearby, and the other could, could have no other schools nearby. And in addition, those five schools could have a lot of slots available, and this, this kid's school could be completely swamped, and there's no uh, other um, school around. So taking into account you know, the number of schools in your area, and also the capacity of those schools to, to serve a child who might want to enroll, are also really important aspects of um, spatial accessibility. So what I did is I took, basically from the house, looked at, um, all the schools within 2.5 kilometers. Uh, I chose that because that's a, a, a range that the ministry that I work with has used in terms of um, determining what is a good distance or a, a reasonable distance to both health and education services. Um, and I essentially counted up the number of vacancies in each in each school, and then I weighted it so that vacancies like these these 50 vacancies are going to be less accessible than these 100 vacancies, right? So it reflects the fact that, okay, yeah, it's in with, it's within 2.5 kilometers, which is relatively, roughly like 30 minutes walking, but slots that are going to be, you know, 25 minutes away are not as accessible as slots that are five minutes away. Um, and so this is, uh, <coughs> again, the same comunas, um, and, and the dark red is the number of slots within 2.5 kilometers um, f for any school, in any school that's within your 2.5 kilometers, and the light here is any school that's both high quality and free. Okay, so there's a couple things that, that stand out here. First, um, there's a huge difference, um, or like there's a pretty big difference in terms of the number of, just generally the number of slots available to you based on what comuna you're living in. Um, and the interesting thing here is that these comunas, Vitacura, Las Condes, Providencia, La Barquilla, are um, higher income neighborhoods, like pretty high, those are, that's the, the northeast part of Santiago. Um, so what's, the, that, that, the, what you're seeing here is two reasons. One is, um, though in those areas, there are a lot more private schools, which are not part of my sample, than, than public schools. So part of that is, part of this is just the Public, public schools are not in those areas because of targeting, that, that's not their um, population. But also, you know, in, in conversations with the director of the research division, he was really interested in this finding because the public schools, the few public schools that are in those areas 
are highly sought after. There's a huge amount of demand. Children will travel from really far away, other communities far away, to go to those schools. And so um, that's just that those schools are not going to have very many vacancies available at all. Um, the other thing I think that's the second finding was for me, like some of these, these, these numbers are huge. Like I was really surprised about, you know, for example, 200 to 300 slots available for, for a child within 200, within 2.5 kilometers. I mean, I, I was like, wow, it's a lot of slots. And that is um, due to primarily two things. So one is the, the, the child, the um, child population is declining in Chile, so there's lower fertility rates. So you're gonna have, what you're seeing actually is just sort of um, uh, unused infrastructure that for, from schools that were built when there were more children. And so you're, you're gonna see this pattern no matter what, um, because there's just less children going to be schooling now. But the second thing is, um, there's been a big shift away from municipal schools, so, um, because I think it's associated with quality issues. And so there's a, been a very much a decline in um, enrollment in municipal schools over the past 10 years, like a pretty strong um, decline, and that's a big conversation in um, education policy right now. And so these numbers are reflecting that. And then obviously the third thing that really stands out is the enormous drop that happens in available slots when you start looking at only schools that are um, high quality and uh, free. Um, and for me, what I thought was 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 uh, curious is that it's not always the same relationship. Um, like, and I so I circled here Pudahuel and La, La Quintana, for example, which have roughly the same amount of slots overall. But when you look at the number of slots available that are high quality and and free, there's actually like you know there's way fewer in La Quintana than in Pudahuel. And so it's not always. Um, you know, a, a, the same relationship by comuna. So you're seeing again sp spatial effects um, where you live is affecting, um, you know, your access and what, what, what is available to you. So in terms of, you know, just some general conclusions, um, like I mentioned, I, I think infrastructure is not the issue here. The children in general have a school nearby. The issue is really about quality and um, affordability. And in that sense, uh, the reforms that are coming through are going to be really interesting to see how this would affect uh, th th these these indicators because w one of the big reforms is that uh, private subsidized schools are going to have to go either completely private, they can't receive state subsidies anymore, or they're going to have to um, not charge co-payments anymore. So they're going to have to basically go either completely private or completely public, and the, the expectation is that most of them will go completely public because majority of their funds are still state subsidies. So that will really, um, could really have a big impact on accessibility for, for low-income parents, or low-income families. Um, okay, so so in terms of health, I uh, the health system in Chile is extremely complicated, um, which required several versions of narrowing down my, my uh, the scope so that it, you know, it, Obviously, it's not as broad, but at least the indicators or the measures I create will be accurate within the, the narrower sc scope of what I'm looking at. Um, so I focus on emergency emergencies um, because I got the collaboration of the Ministry of Health, MinSAL, and also Chile is divided into 29 uh, pu public health jurisdictions, and I got one of those jur jurisdictions in the western part of Santiago, there is a Servicio de Salud. I got them involved too, and they were talking a lot about how um, there's not that much data about spatial accessibility to emergency services, and the fact that there's a lot of demand for emergency services, and so they were really curious to see how uh, what what the spatial patterns were. So that, that's why I focused on emergency services, um, and I ended up for this. So this the Servicio de Salud covers both a super urban part of the city, but then it expands way out, and I'll show you a picture in a second, but it expands way out into pretty rural areas. And because I had them on board as, as partners, I wanted to be able to create measures that you know, could look at both of the types of rural and urban zones that they cover. So my home data, my, my geocoded home data uh, was not, does only is in urban areas. So what I ended up doing was using um, census tracts to 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 look at spatial accessibility instead of so instead of you know the point the home point I would use the, the centroid of the census tract. Um, but the same methodology applies. It's just a different way of um, 
a, a different uh, or origin location. So what I, I also divided it up into um, a method, one method or one type of one, a slew of indicators for serious um, emergencies like a heart attack, for example, versus um, non-serious emergencies like um, like having a ser uh, you know a bad cold. Uh, and the reason I did that is because um, a, there's a big conversation about the fact that a lot of people go to emergency clinics for non-emergency purposes, especially hospitals, and it's actually a huge issue right now, um, especially in Santiago, but I think um, I also was reading a report about Libya. In general, people are putting a lot of pressure and too much demand on um, emergency services when they should be, you know, they're, they're not actually emergencies, so they should be going um, to either their local emergency service, not the hospital, or even, you know, a primary health physician. Um, so I had to separate those out because uh, if you have a heart attack, one assumes that the only real uh, issue in terms of access is time. You just you need to get to your closest emergency facility, and they're going to assist you right away. They're not you're not they're not going to be waiting there for four hours. Um, with like a, a, a and you're going to be going in, in car. Uh, with with a non serious emergency, uh, you might go walking probably. Uh, a lot of people can walk walk to their health clinic and. You're not only, it's not only how far you have to walk, but then you're gonna be probably waiting for a long time in the emergency um, waiting room. So, so the capacity of that emergency clinic in terms of you know, what's the demand and, and what sort of supply do they have to doctors, that's actually gonna affect whether or not you're able to access those services. Um, so for, so for uh, serious emergencies, emergency services, uh, like a serious emergency, like a heart attack, I looked not only at time to your nearest facility, but also if you have a really complex emergency, uh, it's also going to matter, at, you might need to be uh, referred to a higher complexity hospital. So what's your additional time then to get to that higher complexity hospital? So that's what I'm showing here, as you can see. So your, your time just to your local clinic, and then also if you need, a, you need to be referred, your time to your, uh, the additional time to the big hospital. So this is a map of Santiago. Santiago, and uh, the, the lighter the color, the shorter the drive time. So um, it goes from five minutes up to 15 minutes. So in general, people have a health clinic, you know, if they have a heart attack, they, on average, people have a health clinic within at least 15 minutes. And what you can see is obviously in the center of Santiago, oh, and I should say that these dots are the health clinics. So you can see that obviously there's a huge amount of concentration in the center of the city. And then uh, it sort of sprinkles out um, as you get into more rural areas. Um, in, in the center of Santiago, you have the best access in terms of time, which makes sense just because of the concentration. Um, but it, and it, and it, it's not always completely linearly, like uh, especially here at Alue. Alue is um, a pretty rural area, but it, it, the average time is five to eight minutes you know, compared to San Pedro, which is 10, 10, 12 to 15. And the reason for this is that most people are living clustered in um, areas that are right where those centers are located. So yes, it's a more rural area, but um, the, the people that do live there are living really close to those to those centers. Um, now, if you need to get to, if you need to be referred to a uh, more complex hospital, these highlighted blue are where the complex hospitals are. So you can see they're almost entirely all in the most urban part of Santiago, except for this one hospital in Um So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a graph that zooms in. This is, this, we're going to see this map that's zoomed in, which is um, right here. So this is the set of the Salud that I was working with. So the, these areas are really pretty rural, and then you have these areas right here that are extremely urban, um, right in the center of the city. And so this is, again, the map of just your, your average time to your nearest, um, your nearest Local facility, local health emergency clinic, and you can see all the way here is with like five to eight minutes. But I think what really stands out is that when you start adding on the time to get to uh, a higher complexity hospital, there's giant jumps for the more rural areas. And, and I think all the way is this, is a great example of that because you can just see it goes from five minutes to over eighty minutes. Um, so it's a huge jump if you're needing to go to to a high complexity hospital. And I will talk about policy, poli you know, potential policy solutions for that in, in a second. But I first want to present um, about 
the, the indicators I created for less intense um, emergencies, so non-serious emergencies. So I did look at, you know, just your, your minimum time to, to a facility, but also, again, at, similarly to education, you do want to take into account um, context. So I was looking, I also looked at, well, how many um, health, emergency health clinics do you have within 2.5 kilometers of, of where you live, or of the track in this case? So this is a map of Santiago. Uh, this is, these are, these are the tracks. Um, and you have zero to one um, clinics within, emergency clinics within 2.5 kilometers. Then you have two, three to four, and the, the lightest color is five to seven. So a big concentration, okay? Um, now I've circled this area right here, which I think is a really interesting area um, after talking to Minsal, because um, this is a lower income, highly, very densely populated area of Santiago, and they have great access, if you're just counting up a number of facilities, they have great access in this area. This is actually the, the visual manifestation of a policy push that Minsal had um, over the past 10 years or so to put a lot of local emergency clinics in that area precisely because it's high, it's very densely populated and it was um, lower income, so there's not going to be a lot of private clinics in that area. So you can really visually see that how that's playing out um, in this area. I mean, it's, one, it's basically the best, other than right here, one of the areas with the best um, access. But at the same time, you know, it is a very densely populated area, so um, just having a clinic doesn't mean, you know, having a ton of clinics doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have great access. What commune is that? This, um, this is like... Pintana? I'm sorry? Pintana, La Florida? Uh, no, it's, it's like uh, La Granja, okay. San Ramon, um, uh, San Joaquin. She, yep, as well. Okay. Um, I had a slide that I took out that had all the lists of... Pedro Aguirre Cerda. Hmm? Pe Pedro yes, Aguirre Cerda. Exactly, exactly okay. that one too. Um, so, so what I did, actually let me back up, so what I did is then I said, okay, not only, let's not only just count up the number of, of facilities you have within 2.5 kilometers, but let's take into account the capacity of those, of those facilities. So I estimated potential demand for each facility based on the population surrounding that facility, and then I also got data or impeded data about um, the supply of, so basically the number of med physicians available within each, each clinic. And then what I did is first, so then for each facility, I had a supply-demand ratio, right? So like number of physicians per 10,000 people, for example. And then within 2.5 kilometers of each of each uh, census tract, I summed up all those um, all those ratios together to get a total physician to population physician to, to 10,000 people ratio. So and what that means is that. A higher ratio is better. You have more physicians per population available to you. A lower ratio is worse. You have fewer. Um, and you can see the results here. So um, this is two maps of the same area. Uh, this is the map of just walking distance to your nearest facility. Um, so under 10 minutes, all the way up to 60 minutes is the darkest. And you can see very logically that the tracks around the closest, around the around the um, facilities are going to have the best access. And then as you get further out, it's going to be worse and worse access based on that measure. But when you incorporate capacity, there are some areas that change um, their, their relative access. And I want to point out, for example, especially this. Um, this this is a SAPU here. This SAPU is a, a, a local emergency clinic. It's Santa Rosa de China. And um, when you look at it, you can see that the people, when you're just looking at trap walking time, people closest to it have, you know, a, the best access possible on the scale, obviously. But when you start incorporating the, the capacity, um, you see that actually it does not have nearly as good access relative to the rest of the city. And so you actually have only about, you have less than one um, physician per 10,000 people available. And uh, I was looking at, the number of emergency visits that, that this clinic receives, and it receives like over 60,000 emergency visits a year, uh, which is similar to what some of these other SAPUs, uh, other clinics right, right in the city have, um, but they have other clinics in the area to help deflect some of that demand, whereas there's nothing else really in this area. 
So people living around here don't have anywhere else to go that's that's close by. So you can so incorporating capacity does really affect um, these these uh, elements of spatial accessibility. So my my sort of conclusions um, about salud, I mean about health, <laughs> is that um, one is that I also think health, the public health system is fairly well targeted, and that kind of goes back to this map where you have. A, they're really focused in here in this lower income dense area. And this is the Las Condes Itacura high income area, where you're going to have a lot of private health clinics that weren't part of my study, so they're not included there. Um, but you know, you would want to, this is a tool that you would want to use in, in conjunction with other considerations like socioeconomic status of the area and things like that. Um, so I think one is that there's, it's pretty well targeted, the, the system as it is right now. Um, but there's definitely capacity issues. So the World Health Organization has like as a lower lowest threshold, um, one or, or ten physicians per ten thousand people. Um, and so, if we're just going to extrapolate out, about forty percent of medical visits in Chile are emergency visits. So you would think that the World Health Organization would want at least four um, f four physicians per ten thousand people for emergency health services. But when you look at um, when you look at this, right, this map here, we have zero, zero to one, and then one to five. I should have put it at one to four. But there's there's actually a lot of area um, that's not meeting those those that um, you know that minimum threshold of, of capacity um, that would be recommended. So I think capacity is still a big issue, and these findings are definitely reflected in the conversation that I already mentioned about the fact that there's a lot of excess demand in hospitals, um, emergency services are, are overwhelmed, um, wait lists are out of control, there's long waiting times, and so uh, the, in those indicators, or the, these measures are kind of reflecting that. And then in terms of my little policy recommendation in terms of uh, in, um, like a, you know, serious emergencies is that, um, especially in, in the zones, the real rural areas, like, like out of the way out here, so you can see there, there's not very much access. What what they, what you know Minsal could potentially think about doing is um, building a, a SAMU in this area, which is a local health clinic, but with um, uh, it has more um, better technology. It can handle more complex cases, and so that would be able to hopefully improve spatial accessibility if you have a really serious uh, co and complicated emergency and you're needing better treatment that, or like more complex treatment than what your little rural local um, facility can, can, can give you. So um, that, that could be one way to kind of mitigate um, this, this lower accessibility. Um, yep, yeah, I think that, yeah, that's, that's it. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> So that was our final presentation. But if you'd like to take a couple of questions, we have some time. Sure, like. people have. Yeah. I don't know if you've considered like the political variable uh, in, in in how the uh, focalization policies have been, you know, focused of late. Because like what, just like in like in our overview of what, just looking at the graphs. Part of San Joaquin, Pedro Aguirre Cerda, and um, San Ramon have been usually like a concert, ex concertación or new nueva mayoría, which is like the, the governing coalition now that's in power and what well, has been in power since 1990, except the four year period where Piñera was president. I don't know if you've done like a cross link between. How I these policies been. have been focused, because usually uh, for municipal education and for uh, the local uh, uh, network of you know Sapu Samu that each municipality has, usually has to do with the drive the mayor puts into those subject matters and how well connected he is to the central government. You know, I don't know if you, that could be I like. Have, a, but that's actually Interpret the results through. I mean, I'm 
it'd be cool to even see like when certain sapus or you know when certain facilities were built yeah in certain areas and look at you know who was in power because like the hosp the new hospital in Maipu yeah uh, Puente Alto yeah well in Maipu also but they were inaugurated during Piñera and those uh, at least Puente Alto was uh, is part of the opposition nowadays you know I don't know what they're called now because they have had so many names of the last few years but it's like center-right okay and it, it, it was within the period of Piñera and they had Osandon and then it's Godin I think it's like the guy that you know replaced Osandon who's a senator now but it was focused to satisfy a certain need not only because Puente Alto is, has is the biggest commune in the country has like a million or so people, but it's also it's one of the few, of, of, of it's a bastion of the opposition, and I don't know I don't know it, it could be interesting you know. Yeah, absolutely, fascinating. It was beyond beyond the scope now, but um, that would be a really really neat perspective to take um, for future research. Oh. What are they going to do? Like, so obviously, I, I would assume you've presented the results to Minsal and to um, and the Ministerio de Desarrollo Social. Are they going to continue with the study? Because I think this would be really interesting. Because our, if I remember originally, like you were going to complement it with qualitative data, mm -hmm. just to get that qualitative data on like people's experiences in hospitals. Um, just because, like, even just like, yes, they have access, but they have access for what twelve minutes. And so, like, what, like, how good is the quality of that access? Like, how do the people feel? And like. I feel like the qualitative data would really attest to the portion of like why people are going towards emergency rooms rather than um, like to their doctor because mm -hmm. they can't get an appointment mm -hmm. or they keep canceling. I don't know. So I wasn't sure if like they're going to take this data and start building upon it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, the qualitative data, like I, I would have loved to have done that. Just no time. Yeah. Um, and I don't. I do not see them doing that themselves. I, and actually. Uh, the government put into place some pretty strict rules around how you can use um, personally identifiable uh, administrative data and you can only use it for the purposes of service provision, not for research. Um, so this is sort of feeding into that service provision aspect, but uh, qualitative interviews could potentially be seen. Um, like even when I got there, I, I sensed a little bit, you know, before I realized that I wasn't going to have time, I did sense a little bit of unease with the idea of trying to recruit patients um, to interview uh, for, for more research purposes. Um, so I'm not sure that there's a future for that from the government. There might be a future yeah. for that for me, because that's actually like a huge thing that I really wanted to do and, and didn't get to do, and I think would really um, give an, uh, an important dimension to these findings because of the reason that you said it. and also important solutions you know providers are providers or people who are living this reality are the ones who are going to be best able to tell you how to fix it I think in a lot of ways um, but I but I do think that they're going to continue this, this work uh, in the sense that that you know the, the director of the research division really wanted a solid methodology that they could then use to basically implement and repeat over time as their geocoded data of lower, lower income households gets better. So there's um, a very, very direct link to this, these results and what they have planned in the future. They're, they're setting up an entire website that's going to have all these different indicators of, of opportunities and outcomes and well-being. And they, they want spatial, these spatial indicators to be part of that. Um, so I think that there is a plan to you know, use these indicators to expand it not only within Santiago but for the whole, for the entire country as data as data improves. Um, so, and I'm, I'm looking at your second point. There was talking about four doctors per ten thousand, and particularly in some areas, I'm wondering if you looked at specialty at all because I, I know an, I know an issue that we have at least in Aragonia is the fact that that there are not many doctors, and then when you try to get even like above a primary care physician, the only place in the region you have to go is to Mugo. Mm -hmm. And so there's like zero specialists in any of these clinics. Um, so I wonder if you looked at specialty at all for just like something like emergency where that's really important if you need a traumatologist or a emergency physician. Yeah, I didn't, um, but that was a big topic of discussion. And actually one of the first reasons why uh, we narrowed it down to, um, we, we narrowed it down to 
to just Santiago and then also just emergencies. And then within that, we, we specifically took uh, the, the example of, of a heart attack. Um, because essentially, to your point, uh, the, the way that the health system is set up is really complicated and the particular the hospital that you might get referred to for an extra complicated emergency is going to depend on what your emergency is. So certain hospitals have certain specialties. And um, it's it just like the number of measures and indicators that I would have to create to, to like replicate all that is just like infinite and just ripple out of control. So we, we narrowed it down. Um, but I mean, I think that's absolutely a limitation of, of these indicators is, you know, if you have a certain type of emergency, these, these indicators aren't going to necessarily, if, um, I mean, I think time to your local, to your nearest local facility is, is always going to be relevant. They have to take you somewhere, then they triage you, they figure out where you need to go, and then they send you there. But that second, that second step of what hospital, um, it's, it's, like you said, it's mostly going to be in the center of the bigger city, so everybody has to go in Santiago at some point. So perhaps also the general amount of time, like if you're way out in a rural area, you have to go to one hospital, the other hospital, it's going to, they're all, they're all going to be in Santiago, so like give or take 10 minutes out of 40, for example. But I think it's still, it's, it's, it's less precise than one would, would want. Um, and one, one future direction is that, you know, mean cell, if they're interested, they could take this methodology and then, you know, um, take for you know take each specialization and be like okay what would be the higher complexity hospital for this specialization let's run the model for this other one right and you could have several different maps they're just um, out of time and, and too complicated and and actually data data was a huge issue um, with in health like a really big issue uh, even just getting the number of providers per facility was really really difficult. Um, there's not like it's not that that information isn't known. It's just not systematically collected in, in any one area, and that and that makes it really hard to um, be able to then incorporate in indicators that are trying to look over a large geographic territory, right? If I focused on like one hospital or two hospitals, then you go there and you like you know talk to the person who has that information and you get it. But I was trying to look at something that's um, you can kind of standard standardize across all the different hospitals to get a, a little bit of a more global picture of global access. Um, but I think probably I, I mentioned that because I think also figuring out exactly how many physicians of each particular specialty to be able to also calculate capacity would would be another um, a whole other data battle. Would you rather get hurt here or in the U.S.? <laughs> Based on, I don't know, I haven't um, studied spatial accessibility in the U.S. Um, I guess if I'm uninsured, maybe I'd prefer to be hurt here. <laughs> <laughs>